on implant dentistry, focused on immediate loading, and also on lasers in dentistry. And the topic came to me from Maurice, so he is responsible for the word controversies, because for me, controversy is not to use lasers in implant dentistry or in dentistry, and there is definitely no controversy to use immediate loading. And I cite here the name of Dr. Park with his great presentation today morning when he said, this is almost, for some cases, standard of care. So I start for the next 15 minutes to talk about lasers in implant dentistry. And always at the end of any presentation, everybody comes and says, what is the correct laser wavelength for your clinical practice? Please, after, after my lecture, please, after this lunch break, you should remember what I will say. We start with physics early afternoon. And this is the most important thing, the most important piece in laser dentistry. We have the visible and the non-visible infrared or UV wavelengths, visible for the human eye. Maybe the pets can recognize different wavelengths. The NDIAC 1064, erbium 2940, erbium chromium in uh, YHGG is almost the same, 10,600 nanometers, the CO2 laser, and we have in a range between 810 and 980 nanometers the diode lasers. All of these lasers are the most common lasers in laser dentistry, not only laser implant dentistry. Here, this specific schematic drawing shows to you the absorption coefficient from water in the different wavelengths. So, which means if you have an erbium yak laser or erbium chromium, this will absorb the water faster compared to a CO2 and faster than an NDIAC laser. But if you use a chromophore like hemoglobin and you have to coagulate a blood vessel, for example, the absorption coefficient in the level of NDIAC at the wavelength of 1.06 micrometers, it is higher than the curve would show is lower here in the erbium or CO2 laser. So this is more important, which you cannot find in any, any book or any publication. The penetration depth when you cut tissues in the different wavelengths is different from laser 800, 810 to 1064, which is the NDIAC laser, which shows folks, and I say that so clearly, 4.6 millimeter penetration depth if you use the NDIAC. And I say that so clear because in the AAP, there are so many companies producing a lot of advertisement using NDIAC laser in implant and periodontal surgery. Be careful. If you are a dental technician, and I have Aunt Hanson here, he knows very well if he uses a laser in his dental lab, he uses an NDIAC laser in order to do what? To melt metals. So, next statement. What happens now with the bone healing? If you have to deal with uh, rabbit tibia, a group here with me together in Israel was uh, involved here from this study. In the tibia of rabbits, we did osteotomies with the erbium yak laser versus with the conventional osteotomy with the drill. And you see very well after three weeks or three months, the laser group is improved here, the osseointegration. integration. You get more BIC, percentages after three months if you use the erbium yak laser. Why? The next group, the next publication shows that we get an expression of PDGF, platelet derived growth factor, for the people who don't know in the audience, after four days using the laser uh, compared to the control group, which shows maybe you don't need the, um, the uh, PRF. Maybe you use a laser and you have similar or better results. What happens now, as Maurice mentioned, about decontamination? And this is an area where I'm working since 1994, decontamination of dental implants. We have done studies in Europe at that time, 2002, the first preliminary data, when we can reduce significantly the PG and the PI on, um, on uh, uh, implant surfaces using the CO2 laser. And now, please, if you want to take photos, please take this photo. Because people ask me, oh, this has never been published in English. And this has been published in Journal of Perio. And I hope that you understand this journal. And this is High Impact Factor Journal from the AP in the year 2000. I do that in order to understand after lunch break this funny way of understanding. Because this shows that NDIAC laser melts the implant surface in seconds. 
And as I said in the, in the podium in the AP years ago, do you want to notice that? Don't use it before you go to the human uh, oral cavity. Take an implant which may be failed. Take your fingers, hold the implant, and go with a non-contact irradiation of three millimeters distance. And when you burn your fingers, you will understand how painful it would be for the patient. I'm sorry, but this is a true story, Maurice. You brought me here, I have to, to, to say the truth. So CO2 laser does not modify the implant surface, the non-irradiated versus irradiated surface. And now unpublished data for you folks to understand that this is not a controversy like Maurice believes. And the idea also, implant dentistry and laser dentistry, there is then not a controversy, but this is a science. You see here that I have two laser pointers, a green and a red. Both are diode lasers. But if you look here, diode 810 modifies the implant surface, means melts the implant surface. And diode 980 does not change the implant surface, which means we have opportunities for this technology if you know what you do. And the CO2 is exactly the same, no modification and melting with the, C with the other laser. Erbiomiac laser, look what happens. Reduction of the, of the probing pocket depth according to Schwartz and co-workers if you use the Erbiomiac laser in clinical studies. But the same author and his co-workers showed later on in John of Klinger period 2011 in 38 defects that if you use plastic curettes and cotton pellets and sterile saline, and I think the Atlanta team shows and knows that it doesn't bring anything, plastic curette, that the control group and the Erbiumiac laser group is almost the same in terms of bone fill. That's why we have done studies before Frank Schwartz and we published in Europe, or when I was in Europe, in the IGPRD, and later when I came and I brought this, this technology to NYU, in comparison with the animal research from, uh, Frank, uh, from Herbert Deppe from the University of Munich, that we get a real integration after decontamination with the CO2 laser. And look, examples. If you use the CO2 laser and you have this intrabony defect, and I think this defect is relatively deep because this is probing a 12 millimeter probe, and this is 14 millimeter implant, and you decontaminate the bone and the implant surface because for me, a perimplantitis is not a disease of the implant. The implant doesn't have blood supply. It's a disease of the bone around the implant. It's an osteitis, okay? Then you go here and you go use a bone mineral and a membrane, as you know, and they clo you close the flap. After a three-year period, you see new bone formation, at least bone-like tissue because I didn't kill here I didn't remove the implant and the surrounding tissue. So in another case, and in reality, this was my first case in my career where this uh, 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 bridge was a screw retain restoration and was removed. And after that, I decontaminated with a CO2 laser, the bone and the implant surface. With the same concept, we had a similar result after four years of surgery. So for me, it's not a controversy. I removed three options Three, three cases in my life when I have an implant. An implant which is a mobile implant and has perimplantitis, an implant which is broken, and an implant which has been placed in wrong position. Any other implant with bone loss and perimplantitis will be treated until 2016. And now I move to the next topic. And I have actually a little bit longer time, immediate function loading. So immediate functional loading is an experience uh, f almost 20 years now. And I'd like to show you now different kind of procedures. And I would agree in the most part with Dr. Park today. For me, it's almost standard of care, this kind of concept. Why? Because I know what I need before I select a patient for immediate functional loading. And functional loading means in occlusal contacts. Using stock abutments immediately after surgery, six implants in place, postoperatively you see the bone level. And I'm here, folks, because I respect the friendship I have with the group and the family of Salamas and David Garber. And I don't want to blame anybody. If I come here, I would not show to you six months follow-ups. I'm coming here to show you to show you results over five years. So, five years follow-up the soft tissue around the stock abutment, 
The restoration is cemented restoration with resin cement. And I really believe peri-cementitis exists if we don't know how to cement the bridges. So five years follow up, the same patient after 14 years. Why this patient has now a removal restoration? The reason is because my former residents who are in the University of Frankfurt in Germany, since I came to US, recognized that this patient had some problems with the ceramics and in the restoration, and they decided to change the type of restoration to a remover bridge, not remover denture. And I show you here the 14 years follow up. Now another case, the provisionalization stage with six implants, not eight, not 10, so you see, after two months follow-up, when I was able to deliver the final prosthesis, and the patient said to me recently, please, Professor Romanos, when you lecture about me, you need to show my photo, because I'm very happy with the results. And you see the crystal bone stability over a period of time. But I never removed these abutments, never. Publications in uh, a dentulous mandible, five years follow up in, with platform switching in the maxilla, high success rates. Why do I need to use this concept not as a standard of care if I have to deal with a dentulous ridges? Why not to now to change the type of patient? We take now heavy smokers who smoke like crazy for 10 years until one pack per day. And according to the IRB approval from the University of Frankfurt in Germany years ago, they had to smoke immediately after surgery in the surgical room. <laughs> I know that you laugh, but I had to accept the IRB. So, and this is the immediate restoration after the, after the uh, surgery. And you see one year follow up, and this is not chlorexidine, this is the nicotine. And this is the three year follow up. And I have to be honest, that's why I bring you here. You see a little bit bone loss, but it was relatively early this uh, bone loss. Why? Because I decided at that time, considering that this is my first patient with a heavy smoking, that maxilla has low success rate compared to the mandible, and I did the mistake to place a 4.5 millimeter diameter implant and not 3.5 millimeter diameter. But today, I would place 4.5 only as if in a fresh extraction socket and not somewhere else. So, results, smokers and non-smokers, survival rate, 99 close percent in non-smokers, 97 percent. Please observe the loading periods over five years. And the success rates, if I have a two millimeter plus bone loss from the baseline, this is for me a failure. You see almost no big difference. So if someone says to me in Stony Brook, um, I cannot be treated with implants and immediate loading in NYU. I said, no problem, come to Long Island and I treat you. <laughs> because this shows the evidence for us. Now we go to a more complicated concept, posterior mandible. Distal cantilever bridges could be used sometimes, but I use here three implants in one side with immediate loading, and in the contralateral side, delayed loading. A split mouth design, prospective clinical trial, randomized clinical trial. You see, this is the restoration, provisional restoration immediately after surgery. This is the three year follow up with cemented crowns according to the project we had at that time. And I show you the five year follow up uh, here, the immediate loading, the delayed loading. It delayed loading, immediate loading. In another case, eight years follow up. Uh, I'm sorry, the same patient after eight years. And then 10 years follow up. Look, please, the immediate loaded implants versus the delayed loaded implants. In this period, the patient received from another dentist also in the university, the same school, in the same setting, another implant system and delayed loading. And he has in six months bone loss. Do you see that? I'm sorry that Dr. Boozer is not here. But you see the bone loss, and here is after 10 years, the same effect with delayed and immediate loading. Hmm, very interesting, eh? So now we have the patient with 15 years follow-up, no 1.5, 15 years follow-up, where he has immediate loading and delayed loading. And we published in another patient, 12 years follow-up, another patient, 13 years follow-up. And we published in the Clinical Oral Implant Research, and I'm very proud for this paper, 
the 15 years follow-up from the prospective clinical trial, randomized clinical trial with split mouth control and test group. Challenging concept in uh, implant dentistry using immediate functional loading. Now we move to removal restorations. For people who don't know this concept, I want to make that clear. This is, folks, not an overdenture. This is a removal bridge. Means there are no flanges. The patient have the full denture. We place four implants in the mandible. We placed pre-fabricated uh, uh, telescopic abutments. On the top, we use secondary copings. We realign the denture of the patient, and then we cut down the flanges. So it means the whole forces are not tissue retained restorations, and the forces go to the implants and not to the alveolar ridge. And this concept was presented initially as the Syncon concept for this implant design. And this concept now, which is challenging concept, can be used for patients who have one or two teeth. And we work as periodontists for years to keep these teeth. And most of us here, we are teachers and educators and fantastic clinicians. And we have patients in our offices where we try to keep the teeth like crazy. And suddenly, implant dentistry has to change the concept and we have to remove the teeth. I think this is sometimes maybe unethical. And not only this, to grind the bone in order to have a very, very big framework, am I right? Do we need this? Why do we need to kill so much tissue? So why not to keep the periodontally healthy teeth to place two implants in the correct positions? In half an hour later, we align the denture of the patient. Here, the patient had a partial prosthesis, and this is the result after two years. And we did the data, also the study in, in a clinical trial in the maxilla with four implants. And these implants will be uh, placed as they have to be placed, but the abutments must be parallelized. That's why conical implant abutment connections for me is the future and not the past, it's not only the present. So now the five years follow up shows that the bone is stable around the implants and the patient has a removal bridge. Now next concept, if your patient has a grafting procedure, corticocancellous block from the posterior uh, uh, mandible from the ramus, and after four months, we go and we place six implants again. I don't need again the eight implants. I need just six or maybe four. And then I go in this crafted site with immediate functional loading. And how do we evaluate the stability? For me, folks, the stability is not important only the ISQ and the period test. But the most important thing is the abutment must be immobilized with the final torque according to the implant abutment connection, means according to the manufacturer guidelines, strictly. And from the moment when the abutment is immobilized and the implant is not a spinner, I load immediately. So I don't need the ISQ. And I say that so clearly because Dr. Park mentioned today that if the ISQ is 75 Newton centimeter, and I had a conversation outside, this is particularly correct because we have ISQ by Ostel and we have ISQ by Penguin. It's another machine. And we have ISQ by um, ID uh, Megagen. So we need to know what machine we use because the insert of the Penguin is titanium made insert, means the elastic module of this insert is completely different than the aluminum insert what the company Ostel has. So I have done plenty of measurements with my group in Stony Brook, with my students and residents, and we have the data prepared for the AO meeting in the next year in Orlando. And ISQ 75, according to Ostel, is almost 65, according to Penguin. Therefore, ISQ has to be defined much better. So for me, I immobilize the implants together. The patient has to use soft liquid diet. And please observe the results after 10 years. Identical situation. Make sense? Do you agree or disagree? Mm. Thank you. That's why I have to lecture only half an hour. Now, this lady, <laughs> that's this lady, this lady, she was interested to have new restorations. One of my first cases in my career. 
extraction of all of the teeth due to advanced periodontitis. All of the teeth were mobile. Here we had to graft the sites with autogenous bone. This is the two-year follow-up. But the patient is married with me forever because I place the implants. Am I right? If she has a problem, she has to call me in New York. And today it's so easy to come from Germany to US. Five years follow-up. Eight years follow up, and you see, and Henry and Maurice have seen this case years ago, and I show always the soft tissue problems because the bone disappears. And I agree when we say the tissue follows the bone. Okay? So now we grow, and the patient becomes older, and this is the 15 years follow up, and this is the bone level. Mesio -buccal uh, mesio distally, no buccalingually but you saw the clinical picture before. So a fresh extraction socket, immediate implant placement, and immediate loading is not the problem the immediate loading. The problem is maybe the immediate implant placement. How do you place the implant? Subcrestally, epicrestally, etc. That's why in cases like that, I always try to place two millimeters subcrestally from the mid-facial aspect of the buccal bone. Now if you open a flop and you have a thin bone and you have to graft, Maybe I have to go deeper, but how much is deep? It's a more important the feeling at the time and the experience. Now I go to a very advanced protocol where we have the data prepared for publication, immediate functional loading simultaneously with sinus lifts. This is the first case in my career. The implants were, were here six and not eight and not 10. Narrow diameter implants, immediate provisionization. For three months, the patient doesn't use any hard foods. For three months. He comes originally from Greece. He lives in Germany. And I tell you, he sent me today morning an email because I canceled my vacation to go to Greece. And he said to me, why, Professor Romanos, you don't come this year to Greece? And you can stay with your family to our house. So well connected with my patients. 14 years follow-up. And now look at this case. The strongest person, closest person in the royal family of Holland. Patient who has money and patient who has good lawyers. <laughs> All right? She has been treated for at least 10 years from periodontitis in my hands. And before I came to US 14 years ago, she said, you live to go to New York, to NYU. Can you please tell me what is the prognosis of my teeth in the long term in the maxilla? And when you see, folks, this bone, this bone looks fantastic, but you don't know that the, the bone is one millimeter in the width. All right? So I didn't open a big flap in the front, but I did a sinus lift at the left and right sides. Maybe Christian could do that better. But autogenous bone from the chin left and right side simultaneously, and six implants. I could place 10. But I was interested to show that there is no need. Provisionization, immediately after surgery, 18 months follow-up with primary coppings and secondary coppings and removal restoration. And please observe, after 18 months, there is no new bone in the area of the chin. Why? Because there is no muscle activity. And if there is no muscle activity in the muscles of the mentum, you cannot get new bone formation. But if you go to the ramus, after six months you have new bone because there is the mass setter there and pulls always the mandible. And the patient after 14 years. And this is the bone level after 14 years. And this is the, in the mandible. She doesn't need to have anything in the posterior mandible as I understood according to the personal communication. Last case. Maybe this is the future in implant dentistry for me. When I'm getting older, I'm thinking, how do we avoid to have problems with cleaning? This patient lost the teeth because of fractures of the teeth and periodontitis. Six implants we can do here, immediate function loading, as you saw before, with fixed restoration. But I'm thinking about the cleaning of this patient, I mean of the implants. How do we deal with this? We provisionalize with temporary cement, a cemented bridge this bridge, and then after the healing period, we go and we put to secondary coppings and our technician makes a metalloceramic bridge. 
and this is a removal bridge. And you know very well that this bridge is more expensive than the high bridge we have in US and in other places. But the patient can remove this restoration and he has a beautiful soft tissue interface. And then we can control per-implant diseases, mucositis, and so on. And if something happens and an implant fails, we can always restore the patient with the same prosthesis. I come to the end of my presentation for the next one minute. Risks, insufficient primary stability. I think I, uh, you understood my concept. Insufficient patient compliance, extremely dangerous for young patients who do not follow my advice in terms of the diet and suit up diet protocol. Spay ribs and burgers are contraindicated for the first six weeks after surgery for conventional cases and of course for three to four months for patients with advanced grafting procedures and lack of the team approach. If you want to learn more about this and you want to put together the 25 to 30 years of my experience, just go to Dental XP or you go to Quintessence International here publishing and you have these two books. And with these words, I'd like to thank you very much for your kind attention.